The following program is a Nightingale Conant production for Simon & Schuster Audio. The most important thing that we have to understand in the world of selling is that nothing happens until a sale takes place. That salespeople are the forerunners of progress and always have been throughout all of history. There is a bias in our society, an almost unspoken bias against salespeople. Many salespeople are embarrassed or even shy about admitting that they're in sales. They think that being in sales is somehow something that you do when you can't get an honest job. Have you ever been to a social engagement or a party and somebody says, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm in sales. They say, "Ah, what would you really like to do? (laughs) It's very important for us in terms of our success to understand that what we are engaged in is an honorable profession. As a matter of fact, sales is the oldest profession. There are many people who think that something else is the oldest profession, but that's just a subsection of sales. Uh, (laughs) The fact is that we can be proud to be salespeople because it is upon our efforts that the whole economy floats. All the people who hold up their noses of salespeople depend for their existence, depend for their livelihood, depend for their rent and their food on the salespeople. Salespeople also, I think, are in the most wonderful profession in the world because there is no limit on where you can go in this profession. There is no ceiling on your income. There are, in many cases, there's no floor either, (laughs) but nonetheless, there's no ceiling. If you are properly trained and skilled and selling the right product in the right market, there is an unlimited amount of money that you can make. And salespeople, professional salespeople, are some of the highest paid people in the world. It's the only field in the world where you can start with very little skill or training coming from any background and in a matter of three, six, nine, twelve months be making an outstanding living if you're properly trained to do it. I want to start off talking about the psychology of selling and that brings us to the whole purpose of this seminar. The whole purpose of this seminar is this. We know that with regard to selling, the 80-20 rule, the Pareto principle prevails. The 80-20 rule simply says that 80% of the sales are done by 20% of the salespeople. That the top 20% of the salespeople always do 80% of the sales. And the converse of that is also true. That the bottom 80% only do 20% of the sales. Our job is to take everybody in this room, if they are not now in the top 20%, and move them into the top 20% by giving them the tools to do so. Now, if you're already in the top 20%, and I suspect that many of you are, then our job is to get you into the top 20% of the top 20%, which is the top 4%. And there's a very, very good reason why we wanted to get into the top 20% and then subsequently into the top 4%. And it's simply this, is that once you get into the top 20%, you never have to worry about money again. You never have to worry about job security. You never have to worry about employment. The people in the top 20% are some of the highest paid and happiest people in our society. The people in the bottom 80% have to worry all the time. Our job is to get into the top 20% so we don't have to worry about money, and then get into the top 4%, and in the top 4% we become some of the highest paid people in the world. The statistics on this are very simple. The people in the top 20% on average earn 16 times the average of the people in the bottom 80%. And the people in the top 4% earn 54 times the average of the people in the bottom 20%. This is astonishing. A recent study done by a large American insurance company found that they had individual agents throughout the country who alone were selling and earning more than 40 and 50 trained professional agents of the same company selling the same products to the same people. And we all know that's true. So our job is to get into the top 4%. That's a whole purpose of this course. The second principle is this. It's what is called the winning edge. And the winning edge theory is very important. What it simply says is that the difference between the top performers and the average or mediocre performers is not a great massive difference. It is always just a small difference. It's just a tiny difference on the margin, if you like. They just do certain things a certain way, a little tiny bit better each day, and it adds up to an enormous quantum difference. Probably the best example of it is this. If a horse runs in a horse race and comes in first by a nose, it wins 10 times the prize money of the horse that comes in second by a nose. Now, does it mean that the horse that comes in first by a nose is 10 times better than the horse that comes in second? Does it mean that it's twice as good? Does it mean that it's 50% better or even 10% better? 
The truth of the matter is that it's only a nose better, but the difference in prize money is enormous. The person who gets the sale for their company gets 100% of the business and 100% of the commission. The person who does not gets zero. It does not mean that the person that does not is only half as good as the person who gets the sale. It just means that they're a slight, tiny bit different. The key to success is to develop that winning edge. If we develop that winning edge, there is no reason why you cannot move very rapidly into the top 4%. And that's very, very important. Now, when we look at this, and many of you who've been through other courses that I give know how adamant I am on what I'm going to talk about now, which is what is the characteristic of successful salespeople. One of the things we know is that there is an inner game of selling. It's what's going on inside the mind of the salesperson that makes all the difference. Harvard University did a study of something like 16,000 salespeople and found that the basic qualities that determine success or failure in selling were psychological qualities holding constant for everything else. And if we develop those psychological qualities, they form the foundation for our sales success. And it's that foundation that enables us to erect a very, very strong edifice. And once you've erected that foundation, once you've got your feet solidly rooted in the ground of your own innermost convictions, once you absolutely know and believe that you are excellent at selling, you can go anywhere in the world and write your own ticket. We also know that we only use a very, very small percentage of our potential for effectiveness in selling. We know that if you are not in the top four or five percent, what you should do is compare yourself and your current earnings with the earnings of the person who is making the very most in your industry. The salesperson, whether it's here in this city or in any other city who's making the very most, that should be the person against which you compare yourself in terms of your potential. Because whoever is earning the most, he or she, is no better and no different than you are. All they are doing is doing different things in a different way. The average person we know is being outsold by the top person. The low performer has been outsold by the top person by as much as 50 to 1. In terms of potential for sales effectiveness, we know that the average person never uses more than 10% of their potential, which means that each one of us has at least 90% or more left untapped. It is unlocking this additional 90% that we move ourselves into the income categories of the high earners. And we also know, and this is the most exciting discovery in psychology in the 20th century, is that there's a direct relationship between the self-concept and sales performance and effectiveness. In fact, there's a direct relationship between your self-concept and your performance and effectiveness in every area of your life. Each one of us has a self-concept, for instance, of how we dress. We always dress in a manner consistent with what we feel comfortable with. We have a self-concept of how we drive, a self-concept of how much we eat, a self-concept of how much we weigh. We have a self-concept of how much we earn. We know from extensive studies that we can never earn much more or less than our self-concept level of income. We can never earn in the outside world more than we earn in our own minds. And each one of us has a thermostat, an income thermostat, and if we earn 10% more or less than that income thermostat, we begin to engage immediately in correcting behaviors to get our income back into that range. For instance, if we have a really good week, sometimes a really good two weeks at the beginning of the month, what will happen is that we will sell and we will earn far more in that month than we had expected to earn, and we will find it almost impossible to continue selling for the rest of that month. I've run into salespeople who have had a tremendous first week of the month, and after three or four days of top sales where they've earned twice as much as they expected to earn in the month, they've actually gone home and closed the door and put down the blinds and gone to bed. We know it's characteristic of salespeople that if they feel that they are $30,000 a year people and they earn $30,000 by September or October or earlier, they burn out and they stop selling. And they cannot sell again to the beginning of the year. I had a salesman for one of the television stations come through this course and he said, you know, I set an income goal of $75,000 for this year. He says, I hit it on October 4th. He said, I have not been able to sell anything since. I can hardly wait till January 1st so I can get back to work. We have a mental block inside us that stops us from earning more than we think we're worth. If we want to earn more in reality, we have to upgrade our self-concept. We have to see ourselves and think about ourselves and talk about ourselves and plan and set goals for ourselves that start us to think in terms of higher income categories. We must achieve it in our minds before we ever achieve it in our realities. And this is just simply a fact of life. Also, if we go 10% or more below our self-concept level of income, 
what happens is we engage in scrambling behavior. Suddenly we start working harder. We work longer hours. We get desperate. Sometimes we look at second income opportunities or part-time jobs to get our income back up into that comfort range, but once it's there, we hold it there and we keep it there comfortably. Our job is to move this self-concept level of income up so that as it moves up, we find ourselves engaging in the behaviors, taking the actions, setting the goals, and actually making the sales and earning the income that is consistent with our new self-concept. We also know that we have a self-concept for what kind of a son we are, what kind of a daughter, what kind of a parent, what kind of a lover, what kind of a husband, what kind of a wife, what kind of a bowler, what kind of a public speaker, what kind of a joke teller, and of course we have a self-concept for how well we sell. We always sell in a manner consistent with our self-concept. If you take selling and you break it down into, say, six categories, prospecting, approaching, presenting, closing, following up, getting referrals, and so on, we find that we have a self-concept that regulates every single area of those sales. Some of us are very uneasy about picking up the phone and calling somebody. Our self-concept is very low in that area, and when we start to call somebody, we feel uncomfortable. We're out of our comfort zone. Some of us feel very uncomfortable about closing. We can tell the person about our product and our service and what we can do and how good it is, but when it comes to the close, we just paralyze. What has happened is our self-concept is very low in that area, and whenever we move out of our comfort zone, we start to feel very, very anxious and uneasy. So what we have to do is we have to strengthen every single area of the self-concept. And the way that we do that is simply this. We become more competent and more skilled in that area. We never feel uneasy doing something that we're good at. We only feel uneasy doing something that we think that we're not particularly capable at. When we're trying to do something new for the first time or something that we've had failure experiences in in the past, we become very anxious because we think we're not good at it. And every single step that we take forward and get better doing what we're doing, makes us feel more competent, raises our self-concept, and makes us more successful each time we subsequently try it. And we've all had experiences with that, haven't we? We all know when we start off selling, the first few calls that we make, our heart is in our throat, our heart's going boom, 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 and our stomach is churning, and we go up to the door. It's almost as if we were, an ogre was going to open the door, or an ogre was going to attack us across the desk. Until we made a few calls, we find that we haven't been violently assaulted uh, even once and that it doesn't hurt and there's no residual physical pain from the calls and eventually we develop more confidence and we relax and we become more capable. Well, we know that our overall self-concept is made up of the average of our self-concepts in all the areas of our life that we consider important, including our overall self-concept as a salesperson. We know also that the self-concept is subjective, is that the ideas or thoughts that you have about yourself, especially the self-limiting ideas or beliefs, do not exist in reality. Many of us think, well, I don't have the ability to do this, or I'm not very good at that, or I'm not particularly skilled at, at this or that. In reality, these are not true. But if we believe they're true, they're true for us. Some people say, well, I'm terrible at closing. As long as you say you're terrible at closing and believe that you're terrible at closing, I can guarantee you one thing. You're going to be terrible at closing sales. Some people say, I'm terrible on the telephone. I'm very uneasy. I hate to call people up to make appointments. As long as you think that and believe that, every time you pick up the phone, you're going to stumble over your words, and you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to perform in a poor manner. But almost invariably, if we have self-limiting beliefs, they're based on erroneous information. Sometimes we will take in an experience. We'll have a couple of experiences, we'll assume we're no good at that. And from then on, whenever we are confronted with that, we'll assume we're no good, our self-concept is low in it, we'll perform poorly. We also know that the core of self-concept is self-esteem. Right at the center of our psychological makeup is our self-esteem. And the best definition of self-esteem is how much you like yourself. How much you like yourself is the key determinant of your performance and your effectiveness in everything that you do. How much you like yourself determines how well you dress, it determines how well you drive, it determines how well you sell, and it determines every single aspect of selling. A person who really likes themselves has a high positive self-concept and performs well in that particular area. A person who doesn't like themselves or who feels badly about themselves in a particular area performs poorly in that area. How much you like yourself is the key determinant of your success in sales, the key determinant of your income, and if you take this sales effectiveness and you just call it life effectiveness, how much you like yourself determines your effectiveness and your success in life. It's the most critical single barometer or indicator of your success, achievement, enjoyment, satisfaction in life is how much you like yourself. How much you like yourself overall and how much you like yourself in each individual area. Earl Nightingale said 
You become what you think about. We know that if we repeat over and over to ourselves, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself, I like myself. If we repeat that over and over to ourselves, we find that every single time we say, I like myself, our self-concept goes up. Every time our self-concept goes up, our ability to perform in every area of our life goes up simultaneously. When you say, I like myself, I like myself, it's like putting a flame to the ball of the mercury thermometer of your self-concept. The more you're like yourself, the better you perform in everything that you do. Let me ask you a simple question to prove that this is true. When is the best time to make a sale? Old saying. Always, it's right after making a sale. Isn't that true? Why is that? From what we just said. Of course, because we like ourselves more as a salesperson immediately after having made a sale than any other time. And because we like ourselves more, we are more effective at selling at that moment than any other time. We find that if you have a difficult customer to call on, and you've been calling on them several times and going nowhere, when you close a sale somewhere else, immediately get in your car and drive across town and walk in on that customer and try to sell them again. You will be more effective, you will be more persuasive, you will be more confident at that moment than at any other time. And it will not be the customer that has changed, not the product or service, not the price, not the market, not the competition. The only thing that has changed is you. Now there's another reason why high self-esteem is vital in selling. And it's simply this, is that there are two major obstacles to closing any sale. And they are both psychological obstacles. Once we've dealt with the material obstacles, the psychological obstacles are the major blocks and they are these. First of all is the fear of failure. The fear of failure, which is a deep, ingrown, subconscious fear that we all have, the fear of failure in the mind of the customer or the prospect is the greatest single obstacle to purchasing. In other words, the fear that they may be paying too much, the fear they may be buying the wrong product, the fear they may be making a mistake, the fear they may be criticized, the fear that they will be disappointed with the product once they get it, the fear that the service will not uh, be sufficient to sustain the product. The fear of making a mistake, of failing, holds people back more than any other single fear in life. Every one of us has bought something that didn't work out. Every one of us has bought hundreds of things over the course of our adult lifetimes that didn't work out. So we have an inbred, conditioned resistance to buying things because of the possibility they might want to work out. We know that that is the case. We also know that the second major fear or obstacle to selling is the fear of rejection on the part of the salesperson. The fear of rejection on the part of the salesperson is the fear that the other person might say no. Now since 80% of all sales calls end in a no, because people simply do not need the product, do not want it, cannot use it, cannot afford it, or some other reason, if we're in sales and we fear rejection, we've picked an interesting way to make a living. Isn't that true? because we're gonna get a lot of rejection. As a matter of fact, most people cannot stand the rejection that they get in selling. In any sales field, we find that there's one third of the people in that field are coming into it new each year, one third are leaving each year, and only one third stay. There's tremendous turnover in sales, and the greatest dropout in any sales profession is the first 90 days. Because until a person develops competence and confidence and a high self-concept and product knowledge and sufficient resilience, to bounce back from the inevitable rejection, they cannot sell successfully. The lack of success lowers the self-concept and lowers the self-concept and finally people just drop out because they simply can't take the rejection. If there were not for the fear of rejection, we'd be outstanding salespeople. As a matter of fact, a study at Columbia University a few years ago concluded that the average salesperson sells approximately one and a half hours per day and that the average sales call is not made before 11 a.m. in the morning. Now, why do you think that is? Well, of course, fear of rejection. Exactly, they fear rejection. And I can prove that this is true. It's very simple. Imagine that your company had hired a marketing research firm. And this marketing research firm had developed a very, very sophisticated way of identifying ideal prospects. And it could give you a computer printout of 50 prospects that would be literally guaranteed, nine out of 10, to buy in a given 24-hour period. And they could give you that list. But the list was so precise that it was only valid from Wednesday midnight to Thursday midnight. And you had this list and you had 24 hours to work on it. Let me ask you a question. If you believed in the quality of the, this list, what time would you start in the morning? Six o'clock? You'd start as soon as you possibly could. Would you have time for coffee breaks? Would you have time for lunch? 
If you could call on people right up to midnight and you just made your last call and it was a quarter to 12 and there was one more person you could call on, would you quit or would you make one more call? In other words, if you had no fear of rejection, if you were guaranteed a high level of success, you would be calling on customers every single waking moment. This is one of the great secrets of success, is that all outstanding salespeople have reached the point where they no longer fear rejection. They've built their self-esteem and their self-concept up to the point where if somebody says no to them, it does not hurt them, it does not put them off, it does not send them dejected back to their office or to their car. Now there's one other statistic which is very interesting, actually two. It is that 80% of all sales are closed after the fifth closing attempt. In other words, the fifth time that we ask the person to make a buying decision is when 80% of all sales are closed. And again, in a recent study, they found that 48% of all sales calls ended without the salesperson trying to close once. Do you know what we do? We go in and we very enthusiastically tell the person what our product or service is, we show them our information, we dazzle them with our literature and our footwork, and then we, uh, when the person has been completely overwhelmed with our charm and our enthusiasm and our verbal agility, we then take a deep breath and we sit back and we say, well, what do you think? Isn't that right? Well, what do you think? And you know what they say? Well, I'd like to think it over. I'd like to talk it over with my boss, husband, cousin, uncle, brother, sister, partner, board of directors, banker, accountant, whatever it happens to be. Uh, could you call back on me later? One of the great secrets of success in sales is to understand that people don't think it over. And the instant you walk out of that door, they have forgotten you ever lived. People don't think it over. When they say to you, let me think it over, what you have done is you've just simply ended the interview and you've if you like, ended your possibility of selling. There's one other statistic very recently. When trying to change a person from one supplier to another, we find that, again, 80% or more of all first purchases from a new supplier take place after the fifth call. And that only 10% of salespeople make more than five calls. 50% or more of salespeople only make one call. So when you're selling to a company and you want to become established as their supplier, remember that it usually takes five visits. I'm not talking about five hours, I'm just talking about five visits, going in, seeing them, talking to them, telling them you're available, you have the products or services, it's usually after the fifth visit that people start to become interested. Now the reason why we're talking about this is simply this, is that there is a direct inverse relationship between the fear of rejection and high self-esteem. That the more you like yourself, the less you fear rejection. It's almost as though they are escalators that go in different directions. And one escalator is the up escalator to high self-esteem, and the other is the down escalator to the fears of failure and the fears of rejection. And that the more you like yourself and the more higher your self-esteem, the faster you go down the reverse escalator, the lower your fears of failure, the lower your fears of rejection. The first thing that we have to learn is when a person says no to us, they're not saying no to us as persons, they're simply saying no to our offering. The big mistake that we make is if we hear too many no's, what happens? We start thinking that it's us that is being told no to. And since it's so depressing to be told no, to be rejected continually, what we do is we stop making calls. We start cutting back our calls to an hour, hour and a half a day, and this is how we do it. We get up in the morning, we say, well, I've got to get out today, I've got to make a living. But uh, first of all, I've got to go and shuffle my business cards. And uh, I've got to go and check in the office, see if there's been any phone calls. All those people thinking over my proposition, maybe they've called in and ordered some. Uh, and we go into the office, and we've got to have a little bit of coffee. I mean, you've got to wake yourself up in the morning. You can't just start off without some coffee. And you've got to chat with other people, get your jaw warmed up, and uh, sort of get loosened up. So we do this, and we spin our wheels until about 10.30, and we say, well, geez, it's almost lunchtime. I better go out and call on somebody. So we rush out, we call on somebody, the call's over between 11 and 11.30, and we say, well, we can't call on anybody now, because everybody's going for lunch, right? And you don't want to interrupt people when they're going for lunch. Everybody goes for lunch at 11.30. So we go and we kill time, 12.30, 1.30 comes, and you don't want to call on people immediately after they get back from lunch. I mean, that'd give them indigestion, wouldn't it? They've got work to do. So we don't make our next call till 2, 2.30, 3 o'clock. We make a couple of calls, and now it's 3.30, 4 o'clock, and of course, everybody's on their way home, aren't they? Nobody's in their office after 3.30 or 4 o'clock, and besides, they don't want us to bother them that time. So we go back to the office and we say, boy, oh boy, 
what a day, no luck. Do you ever hear the story of the two guys that go back to the office at the end of a sales day and one says, boy, did I have a lot of good interviews today. And the other one says, yeah, I didn't sell anything either. <laughs> you see, the reason why we put off making these calls, and you've all done this, tell me that you have, you've all done this where you make one call at one end of town and you make your second call in the afternoon at the other end of town, right? So that you've got a nice solid hour of driving in between to put off. It's almost like going into combat every time <laughs> you keep putting it off. Well, the reason that we do that is that we fear failure and we fear rejection. And every single thing that we do to raise our own self-esteem, positive self-talk, positive motivation, positive enthusiasm, individual training, every single thing that we do to raise our level of self-esteem raises our sales effectiveness. We know that from all of our studies, there is a direct one-to-one -one relationship between self-esteem and sales earnings. That the more you like yourself, the better you will do in this field. And that if you become a perpetual self-esteem generating organism, that that alone will contribute more to your income than any other thing. Now let me tell you why that's true. In sales, one of the things that we know is that all successful sales are based on one factor, and it's usually friendship. It's what is called the friendship factor in selling. The friendship factor in selling simply says this, is that a person will not buy from you until they are genuinely convinced that you are their friend and you are acting in their best interests. In other words, the very first thing that we have to do in a sales interview is make a friend. If you like, win a customer. And by making a friend, we then are in a position to begin to offer our product or service. We know that the best definition of healthy personality is this, is that you have a healthy personality to the degree to which you can get along with the greatest number of different types of people. The individual who really likes themselves is the one who has the greatest facility for making friends wherever they go. And we will not buy from people we don't like, and we will not be able to sell to people that we don't like. Isn't that true? Have you ever had an experience where somebody come to sell you something, and even if you wanted the product and you didn't like the person, you would not buy the product from that person? We know, and just think of your very best customers today, the people who you enjoy selling to and the people who enjoy buying from you the most, you'll find invariably it's the people that you like the best and who like you the best. Isn't that true? So everything that we do to improve our level of self-esteem increases and enhances the quality of our relationship with our customers and increases the amount of money that we earn. And everything that you do to build up your own self-esteem translates into higher quality relationships, multiplies the friendship factor, and makes you a more successful salesperson. And finally, one last point, it is this, is that the key element in selling is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm accounts for 51% or more of all sales closing ability. As a matter of fact, one of the finest definitions of a sale is simply this, it is a transfer of enthusiasm. It is a transfer of your enthusiasm about the product or service into the mind and the heart of the other person. It is a transfer of your emotional commitment and belief in that product into the mind of the other person. And there's a one-to-one -one relationship between how much you like yourself, your self-esteem, and how enthusiastic you are. Can you imagine being enthusiastic and not liking yourself? Can you imagine the two coexisting? So the more you like yourself, the more enthusiastic you are about yourself and about your product, the easier it is for you to sell. So everything that we do to raise our self-esteem increases our ability to sell. And one of the things that we do to raise our self-esteem is that we back our sales efforts with willpower and determination. Now this is very important, it's critical. Because every single time we have what we call a winning experience, where we feel like a winner. Every single time we close a sale and we feel like we have won, our self-esteem goes up, our self-concept goes up, and our ability to perform and our effectiveness goes up in every area of our life. The reason why so many people fail in sales is simply this, is they do not stay at it long enough and hard enough to get those first few winning experiences that raise their self-esteem and self-concept and set them off to a successful career in selling. They only stay at it long enough to have their self-concept beaten right into the ground and then they quit. That's why it's so important at the very beginning when you get into selling or at any single stage in selling, you say to yourself that no matter what happens, I will never, never, never give up. I will never stop pushing forward. I will never quit. I will keep on keeping on every single day, every single hour. 
that nothing is going to make me stop until I am successful. Making that decision alone causes your self-esteem to go up. It gives you a tremendous feeling inside that nothing can stop you. And every single top salesperson that I know, and I work with sales organizations and salespeople that earn as much as half a million dollars a year in commission industries, every single salesperson that I know who is in those levels has made the decision very early in their life that they like themselves and they like selling. That they do not fear rejection because they recognize that rejection is not personal. It's just a reaction of someone else. And finally, they've made the decision that they are going to be successful in their field and that nothing is going to stop them until they are. Those three decisions, you make those early in your career and nothing can stop you. Nothing can keep you out of the big money because those three will lead you to getting the skills and the abilities necessary to be successful in selling. Let's talk about creative selling. How do we sell creatively? Well, in creative selling, we have to understand that creativity is a natural characteristic of all top salespeople, and that creativity is a matter of self-concept. Every single one of us is highly creative. Every single one of us, when we are trying to avoid a traffic jam to get from one part of the city to another, and we're taking side roads and side streets and alleys and so on, we are engaging in highly creative acts. Every single one of us, when we are trying to arrange a party or put together a sales presentation or to convince somebody of something that we want them to do, is engaging in a highly creative act. When we get dressed in the morning and we match clothing and ties and shirts and blouses and dresses and shoes and so on, it's an act of creativity. Many of us, however, think that we're not particularly creative. And to the degree to which we believe that we're not particularly creative, we won't be. To the degree to which we believe we are, we will continually come up with creative solutions. And there's several areas where creativity is necessary. We know also that creativity is stimulated by focused questions, by pressing problems, and by burningly desired goals. The more intensely we desire to accomplish something, the more creative we are in its accomplishment. The more focused and specific the question, the more creative we are in answering it. And the more intensely desired or the more pressing the problems, the more creative we are in resolving them. So here's several areas of creativity which grow with use and exercise. Number one is to find new and better prospects. Very, very important area of creativity, which we'll come to in a second. To uncover buying motives. You have to be very creative in finding out what will cause the person to buy. Because many people have inbred buying resistance, which means they don't want to tell you why it is that they might buy your product. Because they know from experience that if you find out what they really want to enjoy, and you keep repeating that argument over and over again, they will be too weak to resist it. Isn't that true? To overcome buyer resistance or indecision. Overcome this, I want to think about it, or let me talk it over with my boss, or call me back next week. This requires tremendous acts of creativity. To discover new product uses and applications. To discover new ways that you can use old products. And to create sales where none exist. And this is so important because every single sales act is an act of pure creativity. What you are doing is you are putting together a business transaction, which is, if you like, the backbone of our society, where nothing existed before. You are literally creating it with your own mind in conjunction with your product and the customer. And that's why developed creativity is very, very important. And I'll give you some methods to develop in a second. So remember, creative selling begins with thorough knowledge of your product or service. The better you know your product or service, the more thoroughly you master the detail of it, the more creative you are in selling it. The fastest way to increase your income is how? To spend more time with better prospects. So creative prospecting is important, and this requires analysis and planning. Basic analysis begins with three questions, and I'd like you to answer these three questions. What are the five to ten most attractive features of your product? List them in order of importance. Why should somebody buy your product? What is it about your product that makes it worthwhile that somebody should buy it? So you need to know the answers to these before you can prepare a sales presentation. So the next question is, what needs of your prospective customer do these product features satisfy? What benefit does it offer? In other words, what's in it for the customer to purchase your product? And write these down opposite the five to 10 points that you put down. Remember, every one of your customers is looking for benefits. They're not looking for features. The features are simply a means to an end. So then we go and we say, all right, let us say that you have successfully conveyed the features 
in question one and the benefits in question two, and the person is now very interested in enjoying the benefits that you have described in your product or service. Then the next question is, why should they buy it from your company? List five to ten reasons why the person should buy it from you. Now they're convinced that they want it, why should they buy it from you? What does your company offer that other companies don't offer? Now, going on to strategic selling, and these questions are the most important questions that you will ever ask and answer in moving to high levels of income in selling. In strategic selling, you begin by identifying your best possible customer market and then concentrating on it single-mindedly. One of the biggest mistakes that salespeople make is they look upon everybody as being a prospect of equal value, when in some cases, one prospect may be worth a hundred times the value of another prospect. The basic rule in selling is always fish for whales, not minnows. Remember, if you catch a thousand minnows, what have you got? A bucket full? But if you catch one whale, you've got a whole ship full. And it's very important that we carefully identify where our biggest breakthrough opportunities are. And this comes from asking these questions. Who exactly is your customer? Who buys your product or service right now? The next question is, who might be buying it in the future? Remember, you're going to live the rest of your life in the future. And all of your income is going to come from who you sell to in the future as opposed to who's bought it in the past. So who might be buying it in the future? What direction is your market going in? Who bought it in the past? What is the continuity between past and future? Where are their markets opening up or likely to open up for your product or service? The next question is, why does your customer buy? What benefits or advantages does he perceive in purchasing your product or service? Now, who or what is your competitor? Who is your major competitor? Or what is your major competitor? In some cases, our major competitor is the ignorance of the market. People do not know that your product is available, or they do not know that the product is available of the quality and price that you have to offer. That may be your major competitor. That may be your major obstacle to selling. But then again, it may be another competitor. It may be that people are buying something else to replace your product, or there's somebody else selling exactly your same product and they're buying that. Who is your competitor? All decisions with regard to sales and marketing have to be made in consideration of what you're competing against. Selling, in some respects, is similar to warfare. Decisions in warfare are always made in consideration of what the enemy is doing. And considerations in selling are always uh, taken in consideration of what your competitors or your competition is doing. Now, this is the key question, and it's what is your competitive advantage? Where do you have an advantage over your competitors? What is your area of excellence in your product or service? What is your unique selling feature? What do you have to offer that nobody else has to offer? Because this is invariably the key reason why people will buy your product over a competitor's and this is the key to developing an effective sales presentation. You must know clearly and unequivocally so that somebody could wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and shake you and say, why is your product better than anybody else's? And you could say, it's better because of this. And you could say instantly you know exactly the reason where your product stands out above all other products. It does something that other products don't do. Or uh, you offer something that other products or other services other companies don't offer. But what is it that is unique and special about your product or service? Nobody is going to buy your product just because it's as good as anybody else's. They will always buy your product because there is something unique about it that makes it better in their eyes and for their purposes and for their needs than any other product in the market. And your key job is to identify that unique selling feature, that competitive advantage that sets you head and shoulders above anybody else and build your sales presentation around that. Now, finally, with regard to creative selling, the creative method. And this method was developed by Earl Nightingale some years ago, and more salespeople have earned their way to high earnings in their professions with this method than any other method that I've ever seen. It's called the 20 idea method. If you will use this method every day for the next month and apply some of the ideas that you generate, you will double your income within the next 90 or 180 days. What you do is you take your key problem, your most pressing goal, your most pressing question, and you write it first thing in the morning at the top of a piece of paper in the form of a question. For instance, here's some examples. How can I increase my ratio of closes to calls? 
In other words, how can I close more of the people that I call on? And there's a series of answers to that. How can I increase my sales effectiveness today? Or here's another one. How can I utilize my time better today? Or how can I structure my time so that I see more prospects every single day? You write it at the top in the form of a question. And then you sit down and you write out 20 answers to the question. You force yourself to sit there until you come up with 20 answers, one after another. Now the first few answers will come easily. The second few answers will become more difficult. But take the logical answer and then take the opposite of the logical answer. One could be get up early in the morning and get going earlier. The other could be get up later in the morning and get going later. Write the opposite and see what it looks like. Another could be a synthesis of the two. Get up earlier in the morning and prepare, and maybe start a little bit later, but have every single call prepared for and by confirmed appointment. In other words, how much more successful do you think you're going to be if you're generating hundreds of ideas a year and you're implementing one new idea a day to increase your income and your effectiveness? I guarantee you that this idea will just blow you away. As a matter of fact, by the second or third day that you've been generating ideas like this, you will have so many ideas and so many new ways to develop more business, you will not have enough time in the day to do it. I promise you that you try it for three days, you will be staggered at the quality of the ideas that come out of your mind. You just will not believe it. You cannot believe that you wrote that down. It's such an excellent idea. And all you need is one good idea one good idea that's a little bit newer, Marshall McLuhan once said that all you need is an idea that's 10% new to make a million dollars. That's all it has to be is 10% new. It doesn't have to be a major breakthrough. All of the great money-making ideas of today are not brand new products or services. They are merely marginal improvements on existing products that open up whole brand new markets. Isn't that true? And if you use this idea and use this regularly and develop 20 ideas a day, you will be astonished. You will become one of the most creative salespeople and by extension one of the most highly paid salespeople in your profession. And once you develop this knack of creativity and analysis, there is nowhere that you can't go and there's no product that you can't sell successfully as long as you believe in it. We're now going to talk about approaching the prospect. We know that this is one of the areas where we have the greatest number of hang-ups. So I'd like to give you some key points in the initial approach. Once we've done our creative thinking, our creative analysis, we've identified our major competitive advantages, and now we have to go out and actually confront face-to-face -face or telephone call to telephone call a real live person who has never seen us before in our life. And your first contact with the prospect will begin the process which will or will not conclude with a the sale. Therefore, every word of your approach or introduction must be planned in advance to accomplish the following. Number one, it must break the preoccupation of the prospect. Every single person, by the way, is preoccupied. We are completely involved in our own problems, our own world, our own health, our own family, our own business, our own bills. And there's a very good book that was written some years ago called Preoccupation Breaking. And what it simply said is this, is that unless you break the preoccupation of the prospect, you never get to first base in making a presentation. Many people start off their sales presentation while the other person is still on the phone, still signing checks, still shuffling papers, and their mind is a thousand miles away. And your first job is to smash that preoccupation. And I like you to think of it in terms of throwing a brick through a plate glass window. Just think of going to crash through a plate glass window to get that preoccupation broken. Let me give you an example of one of the most successful preoccupation breaking approaches ever used. It was developed by a salesman at Corning Glass. The year that Corning Glass came out with safety glass. And he went out throughout the country and he became the top selling salesman of safety glass for Corning Glass in North America. And at the National Sales Convention, he was given a big prize and an award. And they said, please tell us your secret. How is it you sold so much more than everybody else? He said, it's very simple. He said, first of all, I got some pieces of safety glass cut into six inch by six inch pieces as samples and I got a ball-peen hammer. And then I'd walk in on the prospect, and I'd say, you'd like to see a piece of glass that doesn't shatter. And the guy says, I don't believe it. I'd put the glass on the counter, and i go, whack, and hit it, and he'd protect his eyes. He'd say, geez. And he'd look back down, he'd say, holy smokes, that's incredible. And I'd say, how much would you like? And I'd pull out my order pad and start writing. Well, Corning Glass was so impressed with this that they bought all of their salespeople ball-peen hammers and sample sheets of glass and sent them out, and they sold glass by the carload. You see, a good opening, 
a good, strong question aimed at the result or benefit of your product gets you almost all the way to the close. It gets the person alert, it breaks their preoccupation, they give you their complete attention, and they're willing to listen to you. You only have 30 seconds at the beginning of the approach to get the person's complete attention. In the first 30 seconds, the person decides whether or not they're going to listen to you. If you waffle, or if you're just friendly, or if you're easygoing, or if you hope that they've got some time to talk to you, within 30 seconds, they've turned you off and tuned out. So your opening question has to be planned word for word, rehearsed in front of a mirror, memorized and practiced over and over again. Then you have to go out and try it on real live prospects and see what sort of response you get. Let me give you an example. I used to sell sales training, motivational training. And I would call up somebody and I'd say, I'd like to talk to you about training your salespeople. They'd say, no, sorry, I thank you, I can't afford it. Uh, we don't have the time, we're all busy, we've got all the training in the world, they've all been trained, they don't need training, uh, sales are down, business is bad, we don't have any cash, our budget is shot. Same things that they tell us all the time. So I found that I wasn't getting anywhere with that approach and I sat down and I looked at it. I spent several days, as a matter of fact, working and reworking and trying to think, how could I approach organizations with salespeople more effectively? And I came to an interesting conclusion. I said, what is the basic need of the person who determines whether or not there will be sales training offered in the company? Well, the person is usually the sales manager or the company owner, and his basic concern is increased sales, right? So I said, why don't I ask a question that focuses on that specific need? And I wrote out a question, and I started calling people for appointments. And my question was simply this. I'd ask the receptionist, who's in charge of sales training in your organization? Well, that would be Mr. So-and-so. So I'd get the name, and I'd get transferred to Mr. So-and-so, and I'd say, Mr. Smith, my name is Brian Tracy, and I'm with the Institute for Executive Development. And I wonder if you would be interested in a proven method that can increase your sales by 20 to 30% over the next 12 months. What kind of responses do you think I got? Every single one of them said, what is it? How does it work? When can you come in and see me? because every single one of them was concerned about sales. Your opening question must answer this question. Why should I listen to you? When you have an approach question, it should answer the question, why should I listen to you? My question was, this is why you should listen to me, because I can increase your sales by 20 to 30 percent over the next 12 months. The next question, which should be generated by your opening question, is what is it? Your opening remark should cause the person to say, what have you got? What is it? If it doesn't generate that response, then it's not a good enough question. It's not breaking the person's preoccupation. If the person says, well, I'm really not interested, it means that your opening question is not emphatic enough. It's not aimed at something that the customer wants. It's amazing how many people introduce themselves and their company and their product line and how long they've been in town, none of which is of any interest to the customer. And finally, the customer says, well, I'm really not interested. Thank you very much. So what you do is you drop everything and you focus solely on the key benefit that you think that person wants to enjoy. You're selling microcomputer products, you walk in, you don't say, do you currently have a computer? Are you interested in a computer? You say, how would you like to save $1,000 a month on your administrative costs? What's the answer to that question? What is it? That's right, how do I do it? For that, I'm willing to listen to you for a few seconds. Now, you may have something and you may not, but for that kind of a benefit, I'm willing to give you a couple of minutes. You've got my attention, sir. You see, and this is the importance of the question. As I say, 95% of people wing it and they can't understand why they're so frustrated in their telephone and in their personal presentations. So moving on, your first selling job is to get the person to listen to you. And before the prospect will relax and listen to you, he wants to be sure of five things. He wants to be sure that you have something important to communicate. That's why you hint at the result or benefit in your first sentence. The second thing is he wants to make sure that you're talking to the right buyer. Now, you should have qualified by going through the receptionist or someone else to make sure you're talking to the right person. And if you have any doubts at all, ask them, are you the person that I would talk to about increasing sales in your organization? Are you the person that I would talk to about cutting costs of administration? Are you the person that I would talk to with regard to this particular benefit within the organization? And the person will say, yes, I am, or no, I'm not. But by all means, be sure you're talking to the right person. There's no point in doing a wonderful sales presentation to somebody who's not in a position to make a buying decision. You also want to be assured that your visit will be short. 
People are terribly busy today and they become very, very uptight and nervous if they think somebody's going to take up a lot of their time. So you must assure them very early that you're only going to take up a couple of minutes to tell them about this benefit that you've suggested. They want to be sure that they will be placed under no obligation and that you will not use high pressure. So you have to do everything right at the beginning of the talk. And let me give you my method for doing this, which I've taught now to thousands of people, and they've tried it, and they have found that it has completely turned their effectiveness in getting appointments around, either by telephone or cold calling. It's very simply this. You ask a well-structured question, an imaginative question aimed at the benefit. Remember, when you have asked a question, the natural, habitual, conditioned response is that the person must answer your question before they say anything else. If you ask a person, what time is it, before they can say anything else, they are conditioned to respond and tell you what time it is. If you ask a person, may I ask you a question? Almost invariably, the person will say yes. When you say, would you like to hear a proven method whereby you could increase your sales by 20 to 30 percent per year, the person has to think about that question before they can say anything else and give you an answer. I only had one person tell me no, by the way. No, I'm not interested. And the reason they weren't interested is that the receivers had just come in and closed the company down. And he said on the phone, he said, it's too late for us. I wish you'd called me six months ago. But every other sales manager I ever spoke to with that question said, yes, I'm interested. When would you like to come in and talk? So the next question is simply this, is be polite and respectful and say, I would just need about 10 minutes of your time to show you what I've got and you can judge for yourself. Now, it's very important because there's a lot of natural sales resistance, especially making a telephone appointment. The person's very resistant. They'll say, well, what is it? Can you tell me what it is? You say, Mr. Prospect, I would like to tell you what it is, but I have something I have to show you. And it'll just take me about 10 minutes, and then you can judge for yourself. You can decide for yourself whether or not it's the sort of thing that you're looking for. It's very important that you repeat this two or three times. You can judge for yourself. You be the judge. You decide for yourself. You've got to get that message across on the telephone. If you do that, you'll be all right. You see, anybody can give you 10 minutes. They can't give you half an hour before the month after next, but they can give you 10 minutes right away if you've got something that's of interest to them. So you say, you be the judge, I just need 10 minutes of your time. And then say, would tomorrow afternoon or the next morning be satisfactory? Or how about sometime today? Don't make the mistake of doing what many people do, is saying, how about 10.30 this morning or 11.20 tomorrow morning? You don't give them choice of one time or another. You choose odd times. This is called the insurance company method of getting appointments. And everybody's heard it so many times that just the sound of it on the telephone turns them off, even if they're interested in your proposal. Just say, would you have 10 minutes free somewhere around 3 o'clock tomorrow afternoon? If the person says no, you say, well, how about in the morning or how about the morning after that? But keep asking, how about the morning after that? How about the Monday after that? Keep asking until the person says, well, yes, you could come in around 10 or about 9.30 or whatever it happens to be. Just ask insistently for a time. Now, one of the things that happens here, which you must be very careful about in the approach, if the person has said, yes, well, I'm interested, I'm curious, I like to know what it is, I like to put aside 10 minutes, you have something you have to show me. In other words, you can't tell me what it is over the phone. All right. And then they'll say, well, why don't you call me next Monday and we'll set a time. You ever had this? Whenever they say that, say, look, I have my day book right here is yours handy. Now you know theirs is handy because it's right there on their desk. You say, why don't we set a time right now? Now every time somebody has ever done that to me over the phone, I just smile because I think that is so excellent. It's so professional to say, look, I've got my day timer right here. Is yours handy? Why don't we set a time right now? And they'll always say, why, sure, why not? And they'll set a time right then. And one final point is before you go off for an appointment which you've scheduled a day or two days or more in advance, always call and confirm. Always call and confirm because it's astonishing how many of our appointments fall through for no reason at all but that the person gets called into a meeting or out of town or out in an emergency. Always call and confirm before you go. And if you call and confirm, the person says, geez, I forgot all about it. I'm sorry. I've got this other meeting that's come up. Well, let's schedule another time right now. Remember, the most important thing you do in telephone selling, in getting your appointments on the phone, is to get that first appointment and get it firmly scheduled and to get it confirmed so that you go and see the person. Once you've had an opportunity with a prearranged appointment to sit down person to person, face to face, and identify the needs of the individual, you're a lot further along 
than if you're just on the other end of the phone. So do everything humanly possible and be insistent, polite, firm, friendly, smile into the phone. It's very important. You can feel a smile on the other end of the phone. You can also feel a frown or an intent look or anxiety or tension. You can feel it on the phone. So smile. If necessary, put a mirror up on your desk and smile into the mirror. As they say, an insincere smile on the phone is better than a sincere frown. So look into the mirror, smile, and keep insisting until you get that time so you can go and sit face to face. Never sell your product on the phone. Never try to sell your proposition. Never describe it. One of the greatest things that you have going for you when you say, I have something I must show you, something you're going to find very interesting, something's very profitable. When you say that, one of the greatest things you have going for you is curiosity. People are enormously curious. I had a person call me about financial services not long ago, and he left me with this, I have an original financial plan for you that I'd like to talk to you about when you get a chance toward the end of the year and I'll call you and I'll get back to you. Now the salesman never did get back to me and I'm still curious about that financial plan. I'm still curious about that innovative approach to investment that the person has got, but they never called me back. Very, very important. You must be insistent. You must maintain the initiative. Don't ever expect people to call you back. You as the salesman must maintain the initiative continually until you get the first face-to-face -face appointment. And finally, never, never, never mail information if you can possibly avoid it. Brochures, information, material is to be left, not sent. That's the basic rule. If a person says to you, well, can you send me some stuff in the mail? Do you know what they're telling you in most cases? Is, can I get rid of you this easily? <laughs> That's all they're telling you. And you know how you can test if they're interested? Some people say, well, look, I'm going out of town or I'm going to be tied up. Can you send me some stuff in the mail? What you say is, look, I understand how busy you are. I'll tell you what, I'll be going past your office later on today or tomorrow morning. I'll drop it off personally. Will you be there? This is how you can tell if the person's interested. If they say, no, 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 don't do that, don't do that, no, just, just drop it, don't, just put it in the mail. What they're telling you is, I'm not interested, I'm just trying to encourage you to waste a stamp and some literature and take it from your office so I can throw it in the waste basket in my office. And that's basically what they do. If the person says, well, yes, if you're going by, I'll be here by all means, drop it off. Then they're interested, then you drop it off in person. But don't mail it. Has anybody here ever been in the situation where they've mailed the stuff and they thought, boy, now it should be there. The person's going to get it. They're going to read, oh, are they going to be excited because they really asked me to send it and you call them up and they don't know what you're talking about. They know that they're not telling you the truth. They say, uh, 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 yeah, it's uh, here uh, somewhere. Uh, I'm sure it's, oh, yes, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's under something here. But tell me what it was again. You had that? We've all had that. Don't go into that. Unprofessional salespeople do this for what reason? to avoid the possibility of being personally rejected. Every single thing that we do to avoid the possibility of being personally told no is a waste of our time and will never lead to a sale. Remember that. Most of the efforts that salespeople engage in are to avoid coming face to face with a real life prospect that can tell them no. So nail down the appointment. Be aggressive, but be polite. Now prior to a sales call, and by the way, before you get off the phone, you thank him very much and you reconfirm the time and date. 40 or 50 percent of the time, the person will have written it down in the wrong date, right there on the phone. You say, Tuesday, May 14th at 3 o'clock. Right? Right. So he's got it down solid. Thank you very much for your time. I'm looking forward to seeing you. You are really going to be happy with what I have to show you. In other words, build expectancy. Cause the person to be interested. The last thing you leave them thinking is something really interesting that you're going to show them. Then when you go to the appointment, you're going to see the person. This is perhaps the most important of all. And many top salespeople will tell you that they do this, but many of them keep it a professional secret. Is that before you go in, what you do is you stop for a few seconds and you get a clear mental picture of yourself completely relaxed, calm, positive, smiling, in complete control of the interview. You breathe in, you exhale, you just see yourself as a beautiful, smoothly prepared professional representative going in and you see a picture in your mind of the prospect responding to you positively and you think of your last successful sales call and sales close and you think of that and let that be the last picture you put into your subconscious before you go in to see 
this new prospect. And you'll be surprised. It'll smooth out your whole personality. And if you're a little bit tense, you say, I like myself. I like myself. I'm a great salesman. I'm a great salesman. You just say that, or saleswoman, you say it very, very strongly. You really say it as though you're trying to impress somebody at 100 yards. And you'll do that, and you'll be surprised. You'll feel good. You'll almost be laughing at yourself. A salesman that comes in with a smile just disappearing from their face because they feel so good about themselves has a tremendous immediate positive impact on the client. Never go into a sales presentation without preparing yourself with visualization in advance. It'll make all the difference in the world. Once you get in there and you shake hands, you shake hands firmly, you say, thank you very much for your time. You are really going to enjoy what I've got to show you. Because we know that if you build positive expectancy, get them interested, get them curious, get them saying to themselves, I wonder what it is. And if you're smiling and you're confident and you're positive and you say, boy, you're really going to enjoy this. This is really neat. I'm really glad you had the time. I'm really looking forward to showing you what I've got. They are saying to themselves, I can hardly wait. Now we're talking about the psychology of closing. The psychology of closing is very, very important for us to understand. Closing is the most painful part of the sales presentation. Closing is the part that we as salespeople hate the most. We become the most tense about it, the most reluctant, and it is also the part that the customer hates. As it gets closer and closer to the close, the person gets tenser and tenser. And our job as salespeople is to structure the sales presentation in such a way that we go to the close and we go smoothly through the close. It's almost like there's a bump at the end of the road and we have the approach and we have the presentation and we have the part where we arouse desire and then we have this bump where we have to get into action. And our job is to get the person over that bump as smoothly as possible, to make it as painless as possible. And I think the best example of what I mean is the story of the old fellow who calls up his dentist and he says, Bill, he said, uh, I got this rotten tooth and it's got to come out and I just wonder how much you charge me to pull a tooth. And he said, Jack, he's known him for years and years, he says, well, Jack, he says, charge $35 to pull a tooth. He said, well, geez, he says, Bill, that's a lot of money. How long does it take? He said, well, it takes about a minute. He said, $35 for one minute? He said, isn't that ridiculous? He said, that's absurd. He said, well, Jack, he said, uh, if it's the uh, time that's bothering you, he said, I can take as long as you like. <laughs> You see, we have an obligation to our clients to go smoothly through the close so that it's as painless as possible because whenever we reach the point where we're making a buying decision, we start to feel tense, we start to feel nervous, our solar plexus starts to tighten up, sometimes our heart rate goes up and our throat goes dry. And especially if it's a big decision, we become very, very uneasy because often these decisions are irrevocable. We have this great fear of failure and our job is to sweep the person through the close as rapidly as possible once their buying desire has been aroused and get them past the close and into wrapping up the details of the purchase. So our job is to plan the close in advance. And it's very interesting. Some people say that what you should do is you should plan your close in detail and then build your sales presentation on top of it instead of planning the sales presentation and putting the close on top of that. Plan exactly how you're going to close. And wherever you're in a sales presentation and it's obvious that the person's interest and desire has been aroused enough, then you swing in to the close automatically and you have a step-by-step, -step, three, four, five, six steps where you go straight through the close. You should know that so that you can do it in your sleep. All sales professionals have their closes planned word for word in advance. All amateurs, all people who spin their wheels in frustration year after year just fly by the seat of their pants every single time it comes to the end of a conversation with their heart pounding and their heart in their throat and sweat on their forehead and hoping and praying with their fingers crossed under the desk that the person will take it. Major requirements for closing. You must be positive, enthusiastic, and eager to close the sale. The customer's requirements must be clear to you. You must know what it is that they want and need. The customer must understand what you're offering and must understand the value of what you're offering to them which you found out from asking questions. The customer must believe you, and they must believe your company. They must trust you. There must be a degree of rapport and friendship. The customer must desire to enjoy the advantages of the offer. Have you ever been on a used car lot where you walk on and you look at the car and somebody comes up and says, why don't you buy it? 
and you turn around and you say, how can you make a living selling with as insulting a line as that? You've looked at the car for three seconds and they come up and ask you to make an offer on it. Why don't you make an offer? You don't even want the car yet. The product must be suited to the customer. In order to avoid high pressure selling, those four requirements are necessary. The prospect must want it, the prospect must need it, the prospect must be able to afford it, and the prospect must be able to use it. Very, very important, the only pressure that you use in a professional selling presentation is the pressure of the silence after the closing question. The president of this company was buying a $350,000 computer to put everything on computerized operations. And the computer company had been in, done an analysis, checked it out in every detail. They had prepared a proposal. They'd come back. They had put together the whole sales package, and they were coming in for the close. And he wanted to see how this computer salesman was going to close a $350,000 sale. So they came in, and the president of the company had his controller and had his accountant waiting to go over the final details. The salesman came in with his engineer and his computer programmer, and they sat down. And they went through the proposal, explained how it would be installed, what would be involved, what the warranties would be, how much help they would give them, additional consulting, and right down to every single ingredient, and then the price, and then the total price, and the final contract. And he said, and if you will just authorize this right here, we'll get started on it right away. And he ticked it, put the pen on it, and pushed it across the desk. And the president of the insurance company said, I saw it coming. He said he was going to use the silent clothes on me. I knew exactly what he was doing, and I just smiled at him. And he knew exactly that I knew exactly that he knew that I knew what he was doing. And so he smiled back at me, and I smiled back at him, and he smiled back at me, and we sat there for 15 minutes. And I was going to see if he was going to crack. And for 15 minutes, we sat there smiling, and there wasn't a sound in the room. <laughs> and finally, he said, I signed it, and we both laughed. The pressure of the silence after the closing question. Recognizing buying signals. Well, these are common buying signals. The customer will begin talking faster, or will brighten up, or will ask about price. Sometimes the customer asks about delivery. Sometimes the customer changes posture or begins calculating numbers. Sometimes the customer asks smokescreen objections. Any noticeable change in attitude, posture, voice, or behavior can indicate that a buying decision is near. When you sense that, when the person starts changing or fidgeting or calculating numbers, say, well, when would you like us to get started with this? Or would you like us to get going with this right away? Or how many would you like us to deliver? Or would you like us to deliver to your office or to your warehouse? Ask a closing question whenever you see the person beginning to change demeanor. Reasons why the close is difficult, we've talked about this before, but let's just review them quickly. First of all, the salesperson's natural fear of rejection. We're very, very uneasy about being rejected, so we're afraid to subject ourselves to a no. The solution to the fear of rejection is simply this. Do the thing you fear, and then the death of fear is certain. Keep confronting what you fear over and over again. Keep asking for the order over and over again until you get to the point where you don't have a nerve in your body when it comes to the close. This is very, very important. The fear of failure on the part of the customer, fear of purchasing the wrong article, fear of paying too much, fear of criticism for making a wrong choice. Do you know how many wives hold off making choices? because they're afraid of what their husbands will say? How many husbands because of what their wives will say? How many business people because of what their partners will say? Remember, this fear of being criticized for making a wrong choice is a strong, strong subconscious fear that holds people back. Human inertia, laziness, is a real block to making a change. People are comfortable. They're in their comfort zone doing what they've been doing up to now. Sometimes you can have a cheaper product, a better product, a more attractive product. But it's just not enough, it seems, to get that person to change from their current supplier. And that means you're going to have to work on them, and you're going to have to work, and you're going to have to come back, and you're going to have to keep giving them more and more reasons. The reluctance to make a decision because the buying decision can be so emotional. We know that there's always stress at the point of a buying decision. Whenever we feel stress, whenever we feel it coming out of our comfort zone, we push away. And that's why you have to get past the close as quickly as possible, or often you'll be sunk. And remember, the way that you overcome these obstacles or these objections is to be very, very positive in yourself, very eager to close, very enthusiastic. 
Five closing errors to avoid. Telling the prospect he's wrong, arguing, trying to win. Never, never argue with a prospect. Never tell them that they are wrong. Never tell them that their assessment of your product is wrong. There's an old saying that a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. So instead of saying, Mr. Prospect, you're wrong, say, well, Mr. Prospect, that's a very valid concern. And many of our other customers have had those concerns. And here's a couple of letters from people who had exactly these concerns. For instance, all the time people are saying, your product is too highly priced. It's really too expensive for today's market. And you have sold them. Then get letters from these people that said, when we first saw this product, we felt that it was too highly priced for today's market. But then we went ahead and bought it, and this is what we found, and we're glad we did. In other words, get proof that can back it up. Get what is called third-party proof. So it isn't you saying that it's a good idea. It's somebody else who has been in the same position as the customer. Expressing your opinions to a prospect on subjects of a personal nature, religion, politics, labor unions, health, family, so on, don't talk about personal subjects to prospects. Even if they want to talk about them, skirt them very, very carefully because you can get embroiled in a discussion that will lead nowhere. Don't ever knock the competition. If your competition's name is brought up and they say, what do you think about ABC Company that they deal with? You say, Mr. Prospect, ABC Company is an excellent company. They have excellent products. However, many of the people who are buying our products once used ABCs and they switched to us and would you like to know the reasons why? And then concentrate on selling the values and benefits of your product but never knock your competition. And finally, the last two, assuming authority that you don't have. Don't ever make promises you can't keep and don't ever engage in overselling or saying that the product can do something that it cannot do. We had a situation recently where an office equipment salesman lost a $6,000 sale for a very, very expensive automatic copier and printer because he said it would do something that it couldn't do. And he lost the sale, and his commission on that was probably $1,000. And he had oversold it. He hadn't bothered to check the specifications and find that it wouldn't do it. And as soon as I saw the machine, I said, it won't do what it's been bought to do. The guy said, oh, yes, it will. I said, no, it won't. I can just tell by looking at it. And as it turned out, it couldn't, and they lost the sale, and they lost an enormous amount of credibility. Okay, finally, the major obstacles to closing. Number one is negative expectations. Negative expectations are what we call prejudgment. The salesperson decides in advance that this person is not going to buy because this person is either negative or this person looks shabby or this person is not well-dressed or the person's office is in a shambles and so on. Negative prejudgment deciding in advance that the person is not going to buy, completely takes all the enthusiasm out of you. It just sort of causes you to be dispirited and you don't put your best into that sales presentation and you don't sell. A very good friend of mine used to sell personnel services. And one day he went and he was calling in a warehouse area and he went into this warehouse and there was one person with one desk and this great empty warehouse in the back. There were no offices, no partitions. It was obviously just been thrown together. There's only this one person. He called on the fellow anyway. He said he's in the business uh, personnel selection, and what they do is they find technical staff and personnel, engineers, technical people, draftsmen, as well as secretaries and accountants and bookkeepers for engineering companies or construction-oriented companies. The fellow said, well, we've got nothing going on now. I've just been sent out here to open this office, and we're trying to get some contracts, but we don't have any business at all. But he says, if you want to call back, you know, I'll be here. So the, he called back. He called back every month when he went through that area. He called back the same answer each time. He always treated the fellow extremely well. He gave them information. He called him up and kept in touch with him on the phone. One day he walked in. The guy said, I'm so glad you came in. He said, we just got a $10 million contract up in the north, and we're going to have to hire 70 staff, and we're going to have to have them all on board within 60 days. Can your company handle it? They made almost $200,000 in commissions in the next 60 days hiring highly pegged technical staff and filling them in, bringing them in from different parts of the country. And yet, the only reason that happened is because he kept treating that person like they could be or would be a valuable prospect. Very important. Lack of enthusiasm. Nothing will kill a sale faster than lack of enthusiasm. You must really, really want to close. If you don't want to close, if you don't want that sale, if you don't want that business, the customer isn't going to give it to you. You've got to be really keen and eager. Lack of sincerity. When the salesperson becomes more concerned with earning the commission than with benefiting the customer, their voice changes, their personality changes, 
they start to sound like a Cheshire cat looking at a canary or looking at a fish in a goldfish bowl and the customer picks it up immediately. So it's very important that you think and keep your mind concentrated on what you can do for your customer. Number four is important, different wavelength. Very often we find that we get onto a different wavelength with our customers. We meet somebody that we just don't have anything in common with. For instance, a professional person may meet a blue collar worker, a snappy person may meet a laid back person, an analytical type person may meet an emotional or relationships oriented person. In each of these cases, we say hello, they say goodbye. We say up, they say down. We just don't seem to be getting anywhere. When that happens, accept it as a reality. Accept that occasionally you're going to run into people that you don't hit it off with. It isn't that either one of you are better or worse, it just means that you're different. And instead of losing the customer for your company, have somebody else in your company call on them and see them whose personality is more compatible with them. It's very, very important. In many companies where we've introduced this, they have what is called tag team selling. No customer is allowed to be written off until they've spoken to at least two representatives from the company, just in case it's a personality clash, which is very common. Moving along, I'm going to talk about closing on objections. Now, the basic rule of objections is that there are no sales without objections, that objections indicate interest, that objections are signposts that lead you on the way to closing the sale, that if you don't get objections, you're not going to get sales. There's two ways to respond to objections. The very best way is this, is take every objection and interpret it as a question. In other words, it's not a reason for not buying. It is a question requesting more information. If a person says, I can't afford it, turn it around and make it a question that says, please show me how I can afford this, or please show me that it is worth what you're asking for it so that I cannot afford not to take it. If a person says, uh, I have to talk it over with someone else, what the person is saying is, please give me enough reasons so that I can go ahead and buy it without having to check and get somebody else's opinion. Whatever the objection is, throw out any objection that you can think of that you get with your product or service. An objection is not to be feared, an objection is to be welcomed because as I say, objections are the stepping stones to sales success or the rungs on the ladder to sales success. In your business and in my business and in every business, we have what is called the law of six. And the law of six simply says that there are basically six objections to buying your product or service. Now, I don't know what your six are, I know what my six are, and I know what the six have been in any other product or service that I've sold, but every one of us has maybe hundreds of reasons or objections, but we only have basically six. And in order for us to sell effectively, we have to sit down and we have to think through what are our six objections. What are the six major objections to buying your product or service? And what is a logical answer to each of them? So that when the objection or a variation on the objection comes up, you deal with the objection and you are prepared. You don't wait till you get into a sales situation and try to make up some answer, which is what most people do, and, and throw it back up. Keys to handling objections. Determine whether or not it is a condition. Does everybody know what a condition is? A condition is a reason why the person cannot go ahead. You cannot sell running shoes to a person who just lost their legs in an accident. That's a very strong condition. You cannot sell business equipment to a person who has just gone bankrupt. You cannot sell clothing to a person who's just gone into receivership and has no money. In other words, a condition is a specific reason why the person absolutely cannot go ahead. Many people, when they voice an objection, think it's a condition. Your job is to find out whether or not it is a condition. The person says, I can't afford it. What does that mean? Does that mean that they don't have enough to buy it for cash this minute? Or that they don't have enough to make a minimum down payment? What does it mean? And when you say, well, how do you mean that exactly? When you say you can't afford it. What if we space the payments over 24 months? What if you could get it with 10% down? In other words, is it a real condition? Does the person have zero money and zero income? For instance, if a person is unemployed, there's no point in trying to sell them something that's going to be financed over 12 or 24 months because they can't get approval for the credit. Number two is hear the objection out. Hear it out completely. That's very, very important and listen to it patiently. Don't interrupt even though you've heard it a thousand times. Number three is ask for elaboration. Rather than leaping in and assuming that you know what the objection is, say, how do you mean that exactly? Or even better, 
say, well, as I understand it, and then repeat the objection back to him in the form of a question. As I understand it, what you're asking is this. And then go ahead and state it as a question, and the person says, yes, that's what I'm asking, and then answer the question. Easier to answer a question than an objection. Another thing with regard to objections is compliment the person on the objection. I found all my life when a person says, well, geez, I can't take it for this reason or that, you say, Mr. Prospect, that's a very good question. And I'm glad you brought that up. Or that's a very important question. And we have to deal with that in a straightforward fashion. People like to be complimented on their objections. And if you treat their objections as important and as valid, just like when we have a concern, when we're upset about something, we don't want somebody to dismiss it and give us a glib answer. When we're upset about something, when we're concerned about something, and we express this to someone else, we want them to think about it and be concerned, if you like, and, and carefully consider what our situation is. Number five, use this feel, felt, found method. What this does is it expresses empathy, it acknowledges validity, and it answers the objection. I don't think we can afford something that expensive. Mr. Prospect, I understand exactly how you feel. Many of our happiest clients, or many of our clients, or many other people felt the same way. But this is what they found, that once they had it installed and started using it, the savings were far greater than they had expected and the cost was far less. Well, I don't think it'll get the mileage that you say it will. Well, Mr. Prospect, I understand how you feel. There's a lot of funny claims around about mileage. And others felt the same way because it sounds pretty exorbitant. But this is what they found, that the mileage that they got was actually in excess of the mileage that we advertise, or whatever it happens to be. Well, I don't believe you will service it as fast as you say you will. Everybody offers great service, then there's no follow. Mr. Prospect, I understand how you feel. And others felt the same way because it's a major concern. In other words, acknowledging validity, but this is what they found. They found that if they called us any time up to 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it got repaired within two hours. And if it wasn't repaired within two hours, we had somebody there the next day, and so on. And here's people that you can call and ask if you really want to know how we do it. But it's an easy way to answer almost any objection. Provide evidence or proof. Use letters, if you like. Use any kind of letters that you can to prove that what you say is true. Uh, be agreeable. Never argue with a person. Never tell them that they're wrong. Confirm the answer's acceptance. Does that answer your question? Is that satisfactory? Or does that make sense to you so far? Asking a person, does that make sense to you so far? Or did I explain myself clearly? Is a very, very good way of answering an objection. Uh, remember, you're there to make a friend and to convince them that you're acting in his best interest. So be calm, be modest, be polite, and know your product inside and out. We say this over and over again. Here's some of the objections that we have. Nine common objections and how to deal with them. Number one, unspoken objections. Let the customer talk more. When the customer isn't speaking, just sitting there listening to you, or not paying attention, let them talk more. Remember, a person has to pay complete attention to you when they're talking to you or answering questions. Encourage expression. Focus on the customer's situation. Excuses. Sometimes people have excuses. Well, we're really busy right now, or I don't think we have enough time, or we're buying from somewhere else. These are just excuses. You say, well, that's a good point. Now, can I come back to that later? Or uh, why should we change to you? That's just an excuse investment. Well, that's a very good point, and I think I can give you some reasons about that later. And just go on. Uh, malicious objections. I hear your company's going bust anyway. Why should I buy from you? You say, well, Mr. Prospect, that's, I don't know where you heard that, but it, it's um, obviously not true. And Just go on, or even just ignore it. Uh, requests for information. Well, how does that work? Whenever a person requests information, welcome the objection, compliment them on them, thank them for it, and answer it completely. When people take show-off objections, they try to show you how much they know about your product or service. Oh, yes, well, what about the uh, carbodingulator on the uh, metrificator of the bifarcal valve? And you say, geez, you know a lot about this. Always be impressed by how knowledgeable people are on your subject. Don't try to say, well, yes, but I know more than that. Take the low road. Be conciliatory. Be polite. If people can be made to feel important in a sales situation, they're much more likely to buy from us. Subjective objections. Sometimes people say, well, you look like you're doing pretty well. In other words, a subjective objection is aimed at you. Or you've got a pretty sweet job, or um, you probably work pretty good hours. Whenever a person becomes subjective, it means that you're talking too much about yourself, you're talking too much about your company, you're talking too much about your life, and not enough about the customer. Objective objections. I don't think it'll do the job that we require. 
Good question and prove and show through testimonials and other proof that it will. General sales resistance, it always occurs at the beginning of a presentation. Very important and that's why we use the approach close. Mr. Prospect, I appreciate you giving me your time. I'm not going to try to sell you anything right now. I'd just like to show you some reasons why so many other people have bought this product and let you judge for yourself. Okay? Okay. And then begin your presentation. And finally, the last ditch objection. Sometimes people will say, well, how do I know I'm getting my money's worth? Or are you sure this is the best deal I can get? You say, Mr. Prospect, it's absolutely the best. Now, would you like to take delivery this week or next? Would you like the blue model or the green model? Would you uh, like it delivered here? Would you like it delivered to your home? And you just go on to wrap up the sale. Remember, there's always a last ditch objection. There's always an objection that people throw up. It's almost called a smokescreen objection. It's sort of the last gasp objection. And don't take it too seriously. Sometimes you just smile and look them right in the eye and say, what mailing address should we put on this order? And start filling out the order. And they'll just tell you. The remaining objections close is called the just suppose close. The just suppose close is very powerful. It has two forms. And the form that I suggest that you use, actually use both. But one is the extended form, which we'll just talk about. The person is trying to make up their mind. You've made a good presentation. They obviously want it. They need it. They're interested in it. And they say, geez, I don't know if I should or not. And you say, Mr. Prospect, there seems to be some question in your mind that's causing you to hesitate about going ahead right now. Do you mind if I ask what it is? Is it the money? You string those two questions together. Do you mind if I ask what it is? Is it the money? Then the person has to say, yes, it's the price, or no, it's something else. Then you say, well, Mr. Prospect, that's a very important point, whatever it is. And in addition to that, is there any other reason that's causing you to hesitate about going ahead right now? Remember what we said earlier, that there's a key issue or a key objection. It's the real reason why the person has not bought it up to now. And you have to find it. And the person is always going to be very reluctant to give it to you because as soon as they give it to you and you demolish it, as I'm sure you will, they're out of objections and they have to go ahead with it. So sometimes they hold it inside. They don't want to tell you what it is. You say, well, and in addition to that, and in addition to that, you keep asking until they say, no, that's the last reason. The last reason they give you in answer to the question and in addition to that is the real objection. I'm just not sure about the service yet or I'm not sure that it will do the job that you say it will do, or whatever it happens to be. You say, Mr. Prospect, that's an important question, and I'm sure we have to answer that to your complete satisfaction. Tell me, what would it take to satisfy you on that question? What would it take to satisfy you? What would we have to do to put your mind at ease on that question? Almost invariably, the person will say, well, if you could just do this, or if I could just talk to someone else, who's had the same situation or whatever, and you'll say, fine, but they give you the closing condition. You say, all right, what would it take to satisfy you? And then you go ahead, satisfy them on the closing condition, and they go ahead with the deal. The abbreviated form of the just suppose close is this. A person says, well, I don't know if we can get it into this budget period. Mr. Prospect, just suppose that that's not a problem. Is there any other reason that you would cause you to hesitate about going ahead right now? And they have to say, well, no, that's the only reason, or there is another reason. Whenever you say, well, just suppose that's no problem. Just suppose we could deal with that to your satisfaction. Just suppose we could demonstrate that to you conclusively. Just suppose we could get the price down by another $100. Just suppose I could get approval for this request. Is there any other reason right now that's causing you to hesitate about going ahead? You'll find that if you, they say, yes, or they agree to your just suppose close, what they've said is this is not a reason for not going ahead. If you say, just suppose we could deal with that, is there any other reason? Then they've agreed that that's really not a reason for not going ahead, and you get gets you down to the real reason, if you like. The change places close is a very good close, too, especially if the person won't give you an answer. You've established a friendly rapport, and you finally say, look, Mr. Prospect, would you put yourself in my situation just for a moment? And imagine that you're talking to somebody that you really respect and you've presented to them an excellent product or service and they won't make a commitment one way or another and they won't give you a reason why not. What would you do if you were in my shoes? Very often the person will say, well, I understand what you're saying. This is my concern. And they'll come out and they'll tell you the reason why they're sitting there or why they're pausing or what they're, why they're hesitating. And uh, if they don't give you the answer, then you say, we're really talking about the money, aren't we? 
And then they'll have to say, yes, it's the money, which in most cases you can be pretty sure that people are concerned about the money, or they'll have to say, no, it's not the money, it's this, and it gives you a chance to continue selling. In any case, you have to keep asking questions against objections, and you have to keep getting objections out in order to get the hidden reasons that lie behind buyer resistance. All right, we're talking about closing techniques. And these closing techniques, along with the ones that we've introduced up to now, are some of the simplest, the most popular, and the most powerful closing techniques that have ever been developed. And it is up to you to think them through and think how you can use each one of them with your product. You should be able to close 10 different times and use 10 different techniques on the basic objections that you get and with the type of people that you deal with. The secondary close. Very popular close. This close involves closing on a minor point in the sales presentation, acceptance of which denotes acceptance of the entire offer. In other words, the person is looking at a consumer durable, and you say, would you be wanting this in blue or green? Would you be wanting this delivered, or would you want to take it with you? Which is a secondary consideration. It's not, are you going to take it, yes or no, but how are you going to take it with you? It's focusing the customer's attention off of the major buying decision, relieves the stress and pressure of saying yes or no, and gets it focused on something else. Would you be wanting the regular tires to the radios? You're showing a car to a person. A person can't decide whether or not they're going to take the car. You say, well, with this car, would you want the regular tires to the radios? If the person says, well, I'd want the radios, they've decided to go ahead with it. You will say, well, let's see if we can get this written up right now and get the tires changed. The pressure of the buying decision is passed and now it's going on to wrap up the details. The alternative close is a very good close to use. You can use it for a thousand reasons. It's always giving the customer a choice between something and something, never a choice between something and nothing. Never say, do you want this or not? So the customer can say either yes or no, but would you like A or B? Would you like one of these or one of those? Would you like a tall one or a short one? Any answer is a yes. Selling past the sale, the assumption close. This close is used to push ahead of events and to assume that the sale has been made, the purchase decision has been made, just to go on to arrange delivery. And you're sitting there and the person hasn't said yes or no, and you said, well, would you like us to deliver this to your home this afternoon or will tomorrow be all right? And the person says, well, if I can get it today, I'd appreciate it, fine. Well, let's put it through right now and just start filling out the documentation. Or another example is, which one will you be taking today? Would you like it gift wrapped? Or the perfect one is, will that be cash or charge X? Or will that be cash or credit card? Whenever they ask you that, it's not whether you're going to be taking it or not, but just how you're going to be paying for it. And go on to wrap it up. The assumption close is very powerful because it helps people get over that moment of indecision. Let me say one more thing with regard to closing, is that when you finish your presentation, you must change and go smoothly into the close. You don't sit there and have a breather, if you like. You don't sit there and rest as though you've just had a round in the ring, if you like, and you're sitting there in opposite corners. As you get to the end of your presentation, you go smoothly into the close and you know each step. You're going to be bringing out the purchase order or the contract or the proposal or whatever it happens to be. You're going to be giving the person the proposal to sign. You must know where you are. Very much like a stage play. You notice like a stage play or a movie, the climax, the end, the conclusion is very carefully planned, and everything is planned up to it. They don't figure it out anew each time they show the play or play the movie. It's like singing a song. The end of the song is very carefully thought out, and every single singer sings it the same. When you come to a close, you must know exactly where it is and just switch into the close as automatically as you would turn down your own street in a car. Well, the puppy dog close is another close that sometimes you can use. The puppy dog close sells billions of dollars worth of products every year. And what it involves is letting the prospect touch, taste, feel, hold, try out the product or service. I knew one company that sold office equipment. They sold more office equipment than any other company in the city. And you know how they did it? Very simple. They had one thing. They hired salespeople with little or no experience. It didn't matter. Their job was to go out and talk people into taking their machinery into the office for a week's trial. That's all they did. They had literally hundreds of pieces of expensive equipment. They had a one whole department that did nothing but take the equipment out on trial. They found that if you could just get people to use the machine for a month or a week or even shorter period of time, that the incidence 
per people who would decide to purchase it rather than do without it was so high that's all they had to do. They were just basically order takers and they were fantastically successful. So if you have a product that a person can test drive, can try out, can take home, can use, the puppy dog clothes comes from the famous ploy of the pet shop owner who the parents come in, usually against their will, because the children want a puppy. We want a puppy, we want a puppy so badly. We've seen puppies in the movies and puppies in the television. So finally on Saturday, the parents come down with the children to show them the puppies. And the pet shop owner is no fool. He knows the reluctance. The parents don't want to get stuck with the dog. So he says, look, he said, before you make a decision, why don't you take the dog home, take this beautiful, soft little puppy home for the weekend, and see how it works out, and if you don't like it, you can bring it back on Monday. So they take the puppy home. By the time Sunday afternoon comes, what has happened? The kids have grown tired of the dog and are off doing something else. By Sunday night, the parents have fallen in love with the dog. And Monday, the parents go back and buy the dog and take it home and end up taking care of it. The Ben Franklin clothes is considered by many to be the very best clothes of all. Everybody's heard of it. I've taught this clothes in this course many times, and people say, oh, there's that old Ben Franklin clothes. Everybody's heard about the Ben Franklin clothes. And the reason it's so powerful is this, is that the clothes involves the thinking process that we always go through before we buy something, which is we weigh the pros and we weigh the cons and we try to come to a decision. Now, most of us do this in a very fuzzy way. We do it all jumbled up in our heads. The Ben Franklin clothes relates back to Ben Franklin's decision-making method. And you can say like this, Mr. Prospect, you want to make the best decision in this situation, don't you? And especially if there's a lot of details involved. And he says, yes, of course I do. You say, well, let's use the Ben Franklin decision-making method. Now, Ben Franklin used to use this to weigh and balance and make good decisions. And he was one of the best decision makers of his time. The first self-made millionaire in America, one of the most famous inventors, politicians, and scholars of his time. And what he would do is he would take a piece of paper, and you take out a piece of paper, draw a line down the center, and on one side you write reasons in favor of going ahead with this decision, and on the other side you write reasons opposed. And you say, now let's look at the reasons why this may be of advantage to you. And then you reiterate the reasons in conjunction with him and you write them down. And you reiterate every benefit that you can think of in your product or service and you write it down. As a matter of fact, you should probably do this in advance so that you've got it practiced so that if you ever get into this clothes, you can use it without any difficulty or hesitation at all. You say, now, is that everything? And you ask the person if he can think of any more. He says, no, I can't think of any more reasons in favor. You say, well, all right, Mr. Prospect, now you fill out the other side and you hand him the pen and the pad and you give it to him and you let him fill out the reasons opposed all by himself. And what he'll do is he'll say, well, there's this, there's the price, of course, and there's, uh, well, we'd have to replace the old machine, and there's this. At the very most, the smartest prospect I've ever seen could ever come up with is three. And then you look at it and you say, well, Mr. Prospect, it looks like you've made your decision. Well, another close is the order sheet close. And there's two or three variations of the order sheet close. But the first one is when the prospect comes in or when you begin talking with the prospect for the first time, wherever it's possible, you simply take out an order sheet or a sales contract or whatever you use and start filling it out. The easiest way is to take it out and write the date boldly so the person can see you're writing on the order form. Now, sometimes the person will say, hey, wait a minute. Oh, hey, hey I'm not ready to go ahead yet. Uh, I just want to get some information. You say, don't worry about this. I have a terrible memory for details, and I like to write everything down. If you decide not to go ahead today, it'll be all right. We'll just throw the order form away, okay? Okay, and you just keep on writing. Every time the person says, well, probably blue or two by four, write it down in the order sheet. So the person gets used to seeing you write out the details on the order sheet. Every single time you write one of their details on the order sheet, it becomes personalized for them. It becomes one of their personal possessions. So eventually the person begins to identify with the order sheet and finally at the end of the sales transaction you say, by the way, what is the exact spelling of your last name? J-O-N-E-S, Jones, thank you very much. And you just write down the last name and your first name and initial. Once they give you the spelling of the last name, they've decided to go ahead with the order. Many people don't use this close, and I don't know why, because I've used it under very sophisticated conditions to sell hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of investments, and I've always been astonished at how easy it is. Mr. Prospect, what's the exact spelling of your last name? If they give you the spelling of the last name, they've decided to go ahead. 
And the other variation is simply to take out the order form or the contract or the order blank at the end of the discussion and begin filling it out. Write in the date and say, what is the exact mailing address here? They'll give you the mailing address they've decided to go ahead. It's as simple as that. It's a very easy way to go from the end of the presentation through the close. And once they've given you either the name or the mailing address, then it's just simply a matter of filling out the rest of the details on the form. The walk away close. Now these three closes are very good, especially in retail. The first of the walk away closes is that when a person says, well, I'd like to shop around, I'd like to go somewhere else, I'd like to see someone else, I'd like to check your prices with your competition and so on. What you do is you say, look, Mr. Prospect, we've been doing business here for many years. Most of our customers are repeat customers and many of our customers come from referrals from repeat customers and every one of them have shopped all over town before they finally came back here and bought. Now why put yourself to all that trouble and go all over the place to try to find uh, a better price? Why don't you make a decision right now and we can wrap it up for you and get it loaded in your car this minute or we can have it out to you tomorrow morning. You see, it's a very good reason. You must give the person a good reason for not shopping around, not going through those hours of agony, going door to door and pillar to post trying to find a better price. Give them a good reason and a logical reason is that everybody who shops here has already done that for you. Why should you go and spend all that time, waste all that time shopping around because you'll end up back here anyway, just as our other customers have. Well, let us say that the person says, well, I really still think I should go and check because I'm not sure that uh, this is the best deal and so on. You get people who are shoppers. Then you use an incentive and the incentive is what is called the today only close. You say, Mr. Prospect, I'll tell you what, this is the end of our fiscal period or this is the end of a sales contest or we have only one or two of these items in stock or we're just getting a whole load of new stock in tomorrow and if you will take it tonight, I'll probably be able to get you an extra $25 off on this item or whatever it happens to be. Uh, since this is our last item or we're going to have a price increase, we had a price increase last week, if you take it now, I can get it for you at the previous price. And give them a very strong incentive for making a decision now, a reason to buy this minute rather than to put it off any longer. And finally, if the person's absolutely convinced that they have to go and shop prices, they have to talk to other people, they have to go somewhere else, then you use what is called the go-ahead close. And very graciously you concede. You don't argue with them anymore. You don't try to get them to make a decision. You say, Mr. Prospect, I understand how you feel, and I think it's a good idea that you go and check prices in other places. But I want you to promise me one thing, is that before you make a decision, come back and see me, and I'll give you the best deal in town. Now, the person is now stuck because if they are one of these people who has to shop everywhere, they're going to go every single place in town, but in the back of their mind, they're going to be remembering that statement from you that before they make a decision, they have to come back and see you because you're going to give them the best deal in town. Don't give them a final price. Sometimes they say, well, what is the final price? What is the last price? You say, well, I'll have to talk to my manager and I'll have to check with the boss and we'll have to go through the books and everything else. So I can't give you that now, but you go and get the very best price that you can anywhere else, and then you come back to me and I'll give you the best deal in town. When they finally come back, they say, well, these are the best prices I can get, can you beat it? If you can beat them on price, then by all means do so. If you can't, then you can put together a package which includes the item plus what you'll throw in plus the warranty service delivery and so on, and you put it all up and you write it all out and you say, Mr. Prospect, this is the best deal you can get. And if he or she says, but that's higher price than what I can get it for over at XYZ Company. Say, Mr. Prospect, it's a higher price, but this includes the warranty, the service, the delivery, the setup, and so on and so forth, and it is the best deal you can get overall anywhere in town. Then the person has the choice of either buying it right there or then going back with your final offer and shopping that all over town. And then you say, why don't you give us a try? Why don't we wrap this up right now? What is the exact spelling of your last name? When would you like to have it delivered? And you go straight into another close. These are very, very powerful and it's amazing, especially if you're in retail business, it's amazing how important it is that you have these walk away closes, that you have the ability to say something to the prospect to get them to either make a decision now or be sure to come back to you before they buy it from somewhere else. The lost sale close, which is called the doorknob close. Anybody heard of this one? 
It's a very powerful close. It's after you've tried to sell somebody something and they obviously won't buy it and they are resisting you in every way and they've got a hidden objection. They won't tell you what it is. You finally say, okay, and gracefully you say, Mr. Prospect, thank you very much for your time. I appreciate it. I've taken too much of your time. I hope I can get back to you a little bit later with some more information on this. And they'll always say, yes, yes, and they're happy. You're leaving now. Oh, thank heavens. Their mind starts to go to what they're going to do as soon as you're out of sight, and their sales resistance begins to drop like a thermometer on a cold day. Then you say, thank you, and I appreciate it, and you pack up your stuff, and you get up, and you walk, and as you put your hand on the doorknob with your briefcase in your hand or whatever it is, you turn around and you say, Mr. Prospect, just before I go, may I ask you one question? I've tried to present my product information the best way I know how, and I'm not very experienced in this business. I'd really appreciate it if you would just tell me this. What was the real reason you didn't buy today? And invariably, the person sitting there, comfortable, no pressure, mind on something else, they say, well, I'll tell you, this is the real reason. And they will give you the final objection. And then you say, oh, Mr. Prospect, you mean I didn't explain that to you properly? Oh, that's my fault, dog. Gone. And you walk right back in. This will just take one more second. And you sit down, you open up your briefcase, and you start closing on that final objection. He says, well, the reason I didn't buy was because I'm really not convinced that that machine will produce the kind of copies that we require. Mr. Prospect, you mean I didn't explain that properly? We have a warranty and a guarantee that covers that. And if we could get you that, would you be willing to go ahead right now? And you just sit right in there and close again. But now you have no sales resistance. Very powerful close. And finally, closing on referrals. I cannot stress this more strongly. Every single customer or non-customer, buyer or non-buyer, is a source of referrals. And getting referrals requires a method. A referral is worth 10 to 15 times a cold call. When you get a referral, you are piggybacking on the credibility of the person that referred you. You can get in to see anybody if you have a referral from somebody who knows them closely. So when you are talking about referrals, what you do is this. The person has either bought or not bought. It could even be somebody that's bought in the past and you can go back and call on them. I have a very good friend here in town who is a very smart salesperson. In the first month of each year, after Christmas and New Year and everything, he goes and he visits every single customer of the last year. And he drops in on them and he calls in and he says, how are you doing? How's everything going? Having any problems? Anything I can help you with? Are you satisfied with the service? Is the product working out? He just does a social call, not to sell them anything. And if they have any complaints, he jots it down and promises to take care of it. If they're happy, he thanks them very much. And then before he goes, he said, by the way, we're starting off in a new year. Who else do you know who might be interested in this product or service this year? And people say, well, and after a nice 10, 15 minute talk, they say, why don't you call Bill Smith and so and so? I talked to him over the holidays, and they'll give you names and addresses and phone numbers of people that they know. In any case, this is the way that you get referrals. You say, Mr. Prospect, and this is a series of closing techniques. Mr. Prospect, or Mr. Customer, however it is, would you happen to know two or three other people that I could talk to who might be interested in this product or service too, whether they take the product or not? Well, the person will say, yeah, I may know a couple of people. In other words, this is an alternative close. You said, would you know two or three? They'll choose two. You say, I would really appreciate it if I could get their names. And the person will say, well, call Bill Smith or Tom Jones. All right, you write the names down. You say, would you happen to have their telephone numbers handy? Now, they always do, because they'll almost invariably refer people they know very closely. They'll give you the phone numbers from their book, and you write down the phone numbers. And you say, Mr. Prospect, of these two, which one do you think I should call on first? And they'll say, well, probably old Bill, because he's just opened a new office and so on. And so, Mr. Prospect, would you do me a favor? Would you call Bill and tell him that I'm coming over to see him to talk to him about this? Now, you see, he said, yes, 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 yes. He said about five yes. Yes, I can give you two. Yes, here's two names. Yes, here's two telephone numbers. Yes, Bill is the best. And he'll pick up the telephone, and he'll call up Bill, and he'll say, look, Tom Smith is coming over to show you something that I just found very interesting. Uh, I think you should talk to him. That's basically what the conversation will be. And when you go over to see him, you'll go right past the secretary, they'll sit you down, give you a cup of coffee, and say, what have you got? And you're right into it. And it's better to do that than to spend all day cold calling, looking for people that you've never talked to before. If you get referrals properly and you develop a referral generating system by closing on referrals in each case, you will never have to make cold calls after the first 30 or 60 days in your field. You never should have to. 
If you're still making cold calls, it just simply means that you're not getting enough referrals. They find that in insurance, if a person can go out and talk to 10 people that they know, get five names each, and from those, keep getting two names from each one. They never have to cold call again. Ten keys to success in selling. These I pass on to you as helpful hints because if you'll use them properly and you use them continually, they'll literally guarantee you a lifetime of success in selling. Number one, most important, learn to love your work and commit yourself to becoming outstanding in your field. Take the time, pay any price, do whatever is necessary to become the very best at what you do. The great tragedy is that many people, the majority of people, will spend their entire lives in selling and it'll never occur to them that they should commit themselves to becoming excellent at it. Remember, the race goes to the person who's just a little bit better in the critical areas. And if you'll take the time, if you'll make the efforts, if you'll really put yourself into it and learn to love what you're doing, when you become excellent, that's when you move into the big money ranks of sales professionals. There's one more important element, is that you can never really feel terrific about yourself. You can never really like yourself genuinely and accept yourself as a worthwhile person until you have become good at what you do. The reason why the vast majority of people are unhappy is because they're not good at anything. And every single human being has the ability to become good at something. So commit yourself to that, work at it, pay any price to achieve that goal. Number two, decide exactly what it is you want in life. Set it as a goal and decide the price you're going to have to pay to get it. Remember, nothing worthwhile ever comes without sacrifice. The great majority of people, less than 5%, probably less than 3%, never decide what they want in their whole lives. They spin their wheels, they work hard, they are frustrated, but they never, never set a goal or a target. That's why it's so important to write it down, write it down in detail. Think about it every single day. Get a clear mental picture of it and hold it in front of you. A person should be able to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, what is your major definite goal in life? And you should be able to tell them that instant. Number three, back every goal and plan with persistent determination and indomitable willpower. Put your whole heart and soul into your success. Don't hold anything back and don't let anything stop you or discourage you. Remember this, is that your level of persistence in the face of adversity and setbacks and disappointments is your exact measure of your belief in yourself. You can tell where you're going to be in one year, two years, three years by how well you respond to the inevitable adversities, rejections, disappointments, deals that fall through every single day in selling. And remember that circumstances do not make the man, they simply reveal him to himself. All adversity does is it shows you what you're made of. And you can tell how successful you're going to be by how well you bounce back. As Charlie Jones says, it's not how far you fall, but how high you bounce that counts. Resilience, flexibility, the willingness to bounce back, to take the hard, rough shocks of selling and to keep on keeping on is one of the key characteristics of successful men and women in every field, especially in selling. Number four, commit yourself to lifelong learning. Read, listen to tapes, attend seminars, attend courses, and never forget that the most valuable asset that you'll ever have in your life is your mind and what you put into your mind. The more knowledge we put into our minds that can be applied to practical purposes, the more our rewards will be, the more we'll be paid. The day that you stop learning is the day that you start decreasing your rewards, you start suffering frustration and lower levels of satisfaction. Learn something new every day, practice something new every day, make yourself a lifelong learning organism and never, never stop. Use your time wisely. Always ask yourself this question, the key question to time management. What is the most valuable use of my time right now? This is the most important single question in managing your time. If you can always answer that, that whatever it is, that's what you're doing. You're never wasting a minute. You're always spending your time on the most valuable use of your time. You'll never go wrong. Follow the leaders. Very important. Do what they do. Follow the ones who are going somewhere with their lives. Don't follow the followers. Make the decision 
to look at the people who are the very best in your field and decide to be like them. Get around them. Dr. David McClellan of Harvard found that if you associate with a reference group, in other words, friends, associates, colleagues, family, and so on, who are not success-oriented, that alone can stop any possibility of you ever being a success in life. Your choice of people to associate with, both personally, business-wise, socially, is one of the most important choices you ever make in your life. And if you associate with turkeys, you'll never fly with the eagles. It's so important. Birds of a feather flock together. And it's because we are so affected by the suggestive influences of the people we're around that if they're not motivated, if they're not positive, if they're not up, we'll start to be just like them. We're all in a way like chameleons. We take on the coloring, the attitudes, the opinions of the people that we associate with on a regular basis. So it's very, very important that you associate with people who are going somewhere. The choice of a negative or demotivated reference group is enough to cut off all possibilities of your achieving what you're capable of achieving. Number seven is guard your integrity as a sacred thing. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the most important thing you'll ever have is your integrity. And when we talk about your integrity, we don't just mean that you don't lie or cheat or steal or embezzle or anything like that, because people don't do that in our society. 95% of people are, are very, very honest. When we talk about integrity, we mean what Shakespeare said, to thine own self be true, and then it must follow as the night the day thou canst not then be false to any man. Be true to yourself. Be true to your own goals. Use your inborn creativity. Think of yourself as a genius. Say to yourself over and over again, I'm a genius, 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 because you are. Many people say, hey, come on now, Brian, don't oversell your case. I'm gonna tell you something, that nobody disputes this seriously on the university campuses or in the research laboratories. Every single person has the ability to perform at genius levels in something. Genius levels just simply means that our sensitivity, our creativity, our awareness in certain areas, certain fields is very, very high. For some people it may be collecting stamps. For another person it may be selling. For another person it may be cooking. For another person it may be flower arranging. For another person it may be art. Everybody has the ability to do at least one thing and sometimes more than one thing in an outstanding fashion. What holds us back from that is the belief that we're just average, that we really don't have that ability, so what's the use in trying? Each person is a genius. Each person is born a genius and has enormous reserves of creativity deep down inside which they can use if they stir them up and practice every day. When you see a problem or an obstacle, always look upon it as a challenge. This is just a challenge for me to apply my creative mind to removing, like a rock in the road. Treat every prospect like a million dollar customer as though they were the most important person in the world. I think it was Jesus of Nazareth who 2,000 years ago enunciated the golden rule. Treat every person as though you would like yourself to be treated. That's very, very important. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. If you'll always treat your customers and always treat your employers and always treat everybody around you as though they were worth a million dollars, because they are, you know, we consider ourselves worth a million dollars. We consider ourselves worth far more than that. If you think of how much it would cost, if somebody wanted to say, look, would you sell me your heart? How much would you sell it for? Is there any price you would put on your heart? Now, we're worth an awful lot. We're worth an awful lot to ourselves. We can be worth an awful lot to the world, too. Treat every prospect well. And ask yourself this question with regard to that. I think it's a great question. What kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me? It's called the Universal Maxim by Immanuel Kant. Conduct your life, live your life, as though everything that you were to do was to become a universal maxim and everybody was going to do exactly what you did. If that was to become the rule, as though you were the emperor and everything you did was to would become a universal law for everyone else in the kingdom, just think of what kind of a standard of performance we would put on ourselves. And finally, I'll leave you with this, work hard and you will succeed. Work hard, and that is from Baron de Rothschild, one of his keys to success in life, one of the richest self-made men in the history of the world. He said, work hard and you will succeed.
This has been a Nightingale Conan production for Simon & Schuster Audio.